Christianity is one of the most successful religions ever. Throughout its long history, it has gained enormous political and cultural power and attracted the devotion of billions. So what was the key to its success in Celtic Britain? Hello, my name is Gwilym Morris Baird and this is Celtic Source. As is often the case, this story begins with a Roman occupation of Britain. Between 43 AD and 410 AD, most of what we know today as England and Wales was colonised by the Roman Empire. The trade routes that stitched this continent-spanning empire together enabled the transport not only of goods, but also of slaves, soldiers, traders, artisans, bureaucrats and aristocrats, all bringing with them their different cultures, beliefs and cults. Even though the Celts of Iron Age Europe had quite extensive trade networks, it was the Romans who intensified the economy of Europe, centralising power in Rome and concentrating wealth and opulence on a scale never before seen in Europe. It was this economic power that formed not only the basis for the Roman Empire, but in the long run for the Christian Church. When Rome adopted Christianity as its official religion at the beginning of the 4th century AD, Rome essentially became the foundations upon which the Christian church was built. Long after the collapse of the Roman Empire, the Roman church lived on as an international institution, firmly wedded to the politics, wealth and power of Europe. By the 4th century, Christianity was well established in Britain and had probably succeeded in converting many amongst the Romano-British nobility. The first Celtic saints in Britain were almost all drawn from the upper classes, the old tribal aristocracies of pre-Roman Britain. It's quite likely that in the territories controlled by this Christian upper class, Christianity would have become the default religion amongst their subjects. In these early centuries, the church appeared to Christianise whole nations by converting their aristocracies. But top-down cultural change very rarely works unless it's also supported by a grassroots campaign. This is where the core beliefs of the Christian message came into play. Bonded labourers were obviously well aware of the advantages of joining the religion of their lords and masters. But Christianity also acknowledged the trials and tribulations of a peasant's life. It's not difficult to see why common folk found the new Christian myth an attractive proposition. One of its core messages is dignity in suffering, the very root of pride in a subjugated culture. And let's not also forget that Jesus' story portrays him as an advocate and defender of the poor, the weak and the excluded. Regardless of the church's wealth and power, its charitable aims helped it gain favour with the lower classes. Another reason for the church's success was its preparedness to directly insert itself into the religious life of the locals by taking over their shrines and holy places. Perhaps the clearest evidence for this is a letter written in 601 AD by Pope Gregory, in which he tells his missionaries to the Saxon pagans of Britain, What I have, upon mature deliberation of the affair of the English, determined upon, is that the temples of the idols in those nations ought not to be destroyed, but let the idols that are in them be destroyed. Let holy water be made and sprinkled in the said temples, let altars be erected and relics placed. For if those temples are well built, it is requisite that they be converted from the worship of devils to the surface of the true God, that the nation, seeing that their temples are not destroyed, may they more familiarly resort to the places to which they are accustomed. It's unclear how common this practice was in the Celtic kingdoms of early Britain, but there are signs of at least some churches being built on older pagan sites. A recent archaeological dig in Shropshire reveals what could be the oldest sacred site in Britain still in use today. Just over 4,000 years ago, when the Egyptians were still building their pyramids, a Neolithic community living in the Shrewsbury area built themselves a stone circle and ceremonial walkway of wooden posts. From that time onwards, the site appears to have been continually repurposed by successive cults and religions, resulting in the current building being used by the Greek Orthodox Church. One of the archaeologists working on the site told a newspaper, 
What we actually have is a sacred site dating back over 4,000 years. It appears that the current medieval church is built over the site of an ancient pagan burial ground that has been in use from the late Neolithic period through Bronze Age, Iron Age, Roman and Anglo-Saxon times to today. There are other examples of churches being built on older pagan sites, such as St Dennis's in Cornwall or Pennant Melangell in Wales. Other churches appear to incorporate old standing stones and earthworks, again suggesting that these sites were reused over several thousand years. But this very obvious repurposing of older sites was only one part of the story. The church also inserted itself into local culture, and one of the ways it did that was through story and myth, sometimes borrowing local stories and repurposing them for its own ends. As late as the 16th century, some Christians felt there was still a need to demonise paganism and promote the church. A good example of this is the medieval Cornish play Bilnans Kay, or The Life of St Key, written in Cornwall sometime in the 16th century. The play tells the story of St Key, an early Cornish saint who got on the wrong side of a pagan king by the name of Teidar. The first part of the play tells how the mean old pagan king is undermined by the saint, a miracle worker and man of the people. The need to paint ancient history in these terms suggests the conversion of the locals was by no means a done deal. As we'll discuss during the online course, the play presents the conflict between Christianity and paganism in a particular light, using the imagery of folk culture to communicate a very Christian message. You can download the sources I've used to make this video by visiting the website at celticsource.online or clicking on the link in the description below. Please like and share this video, and if you want to see more, subscribe and click the bell. Diolch about you.